Oh, 
morning for this glorious time this powerful time to sit at your feet one more time and to learn and to feed at your presence daddy i commit this session of teaching into your hand and i ask that you will speak to us as your people we are a chosen generation we're a royal priesthood we're a holy nation father i ask that your word will be clothed with fire jeremiah 23 29 your word says is my word not like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? Lord, that we will all be conformed to your word from wherever your children are connecting this morning to, to hear you speak to them. Let your word come with precision. Let it come with accuracy. Let it transform us from the same image, from glory to glory. Let your word turn us to whom you want us to be, let your word change us. Let your word help us. Let your word guide us. Let your word position us. Let your word lift us. Everyone that is having a sickness in, their, in any part of their body, Lord, as your word is coming out, let sicknesses jump out. Let diseases bow to your name and bow to your word. Father, I ask that it will be all of you and none of me, that I may decrease and you will increase. That your word will be bigger and greater than every one of us. That your word will have preeminence over our marriage, over our business, over our career, over our politics, over anything we lay our hands on to do. Blessed be your name. And I give all the glory unto you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' glorious and matchless name, we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, thank you for coming on board this morning. This is another session to feed in God's presence. And this morning's teaching is going to be really, really special. It's going to be really special. And uh, there is no better time to feed on God's word than this season. That is the only thing that cannot expire. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not a jot of his word will go unfulfilled. And please, good morning, good morning, sirs and ma. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, pastor, man of God. Good morning, good morning to you. And uh, please let me share this, this session on your timeline if you can. And we want as many people as possible to join us. I know a lot of people are in church, online service in their churches as well at this time, particularly our brethren in Europe, sorry, in North America. Uh, but I know many people will come back again to watch this as well. And... I was asking the Lord to give me a message for his people today. I've got tons of messages, tons of messages. And I don't repeat messages. I don't want to say the same thing because this is not about me now. This is about God. This is about his people. And so the Lord dropped this word in my heart today. And I think it is the right time. It is the right message for the season. Hallelujah. We're going to be looking at this subject Faithful to the end. Faithful to the end. Faithful to the end. And anytime I am dealing with the subject of faithfulness, I tread with caution. I tread with caution. I'm very, very careful. Because it is the same measure I measure to others that it will be measured to me. It is the same standard I use to teach others that will be used to teach, sorry, to measure me as well. And so, it is a very, very, very scary thing for you to be teaching the people of God because God is going to subject you to exactly the same thing you have taught people. And so, but this subject is so dear to my heart. There is no time, there is no season in the world where the subject of faithfulness is needed than now. Faithfulness, particularly in a generation where Men and women have gradually shifted grounds. Men and women have gradually moved away from the path of faithfulness. And the Lord said, we should look at this teaching this morning and 
speak to us powerfully. And before we go ahead, I want to read two verses of the Bible. Acts chapter 12, verse 25. Acts chapter 12, verse 25. Acts 12, 25 says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. You will fulfill a ministry in Jesus' name. <laughs> and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And took with them John, whose son name was Mark. Now let's read Acts 13, verse 13. Act 13, 13. Act 13, 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Pega in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. I'm emphasizing that scripture again. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, let's go to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. This is going to be a scripture I'll be quoting over and over and back and forth all through this through this teaching. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Pro, I know it by heart, but I want to read it to us. I don't want to quote it by heart. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Now listen to this. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. One of the greatest character traits in this kingdom is faithfulness. It is one of the greatest character traits. One of the things that you and I will see, one of the things you and I should look out for in anyone who claims to be a believer is faithfulness. It is one of the rarest subjects on our altars across the globe. Because if I, as a pastor, I am not faithful, I can't teach people to be faithful. That is the more reason why a minister of Christ, a believer, or a pastor, or whoever claims to be a believer in Christ, who wants to teach people to ensure that what you are teaching, you are living. Faithfulness is a rare subject that is not taught, that is not discussed, that is not in our Sunday school, in so many churches around the world. Because a lot of people who want to teach such subjects, they are not faithful themselves. And so when you stand before people and you're not faithful, you can't teach about faithfulness because your conscience will be pricking you. It is a real subject, yet one of the greatest subjects, one of the greatest and most important subjects that we need for this time and season, this particular generation, this particular decade, 2020 and above. We are not just in the end time, we are in the zero time. And Proverbs 20 verse 6, the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon, King Solomon. And Solomon, the Holy Spirit, was saying, a faithful man who can find, put in a simpler, simpler way, a, finding a faithful man is tough. That is what Solomon was saying. It is very tough. And you and I know that what I'm saying here is very true. Cast your mind around the world, in business, in politics, in academia, even in the church, how many faithful people can you find? Dr. Jeremiah once said, if you find three faithful men, three faithful friends in your lifetime, you are blessed by God. Three people who will go out for you when you're not there. Three people who are ready to support you when things are down. It is easy, very easy to find people who run around when things are good. That is why the subject of faithfulness is a very, very serious subject. That God has laid on my heart that the people of God should feed on this morning. Please, I want to employ us to help me share this teaching on your timeline. That is the offering that we are giving on this Sunday service. That is the offering. You are giving it to God. By allowing someone else to hear this teaching, you don't know the soul that you are saving. So we are all going to be part of the reward. I, I am not the teacher here. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. I'm just a vessel he's using. And I'm, I myself, I am aligning myself on the track of the word of God. As the word is coming, it's hitting back at me. It's hitting back at me. And I am going to be judged by what I'm saying. So it's a, it's a much more precarious situation for me now. <laughs> because what you're telling people, if you're not living what you're saying, God is going to judge you for it. 
Hallelujah. And I look around. All through the scripture, all the great people, all the great men that we have celebrated, this, the men that we, we use as, as, as Sunday service messages, the Abrahams of this world, the Davids of this world, uh, the Job, the Moses, even our Lord Jesus Christ, the central theme, the central thread that runs through, that ran or runs through the fabric of the life was faithfulness. Every one of them, in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 8, the Bible says Abraham was faithful. Numbers chapter 12 verse 7, the Bible says Moses was faithful. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 2, the Bible says Jesus was faithful to him that appointed him. Faithfulness. They were faithful. So look around the scriptures. Pick any human being in the Bible. Daniel, all of those great people that did fantastic things and we use them as stories. We use them as examples of good behavior. You will find the thread of faithfulness running through their life. Running through their bloodstream. You cannot walk with God successfully if you are not a faithful person. You cannot. And unfortunately, that is one of the challenges we are having in this present dispensation. Because a lot of pastors are not focused on this particular ingredient. These are the roots. These are the inner things. These are the, in, the critical issues, the critical ingredients that build the right foundation for maturity in the body of Christ. Faithful people. What does it mean to be faithful? To be faithful means to be dependable. To be faithful means to be reliable. To be faithful means to be loyal. To be faithful means to be constant. To be faithful means to be steadfast. Reliability, constancy, steadfastness. There are so many other variants, so many other synonyms of faithfulness. In fact, to be faithful means to have integrity. So if you check some dictionary, they will tell you faithfulness in modern English speaks to integrity. Steadfast, loyal dependable how many of you want to have people around you whom you cannot trust how many of you will open the door of your house to anybody to come into your house no one wants to do that why don't you open the doors of your house and allow any stranger on the road to walk into your house you don't want to do that because of what you don't trust those people you don't know what they can do when they come into your house so you want people whom you trust people whom you have related with for years and you have tested them and you can see this person is trustworthy i can leave him with my children i can leave him with my wife i can leave him with my husband there are some women they can't leave their friends with their husband <laughs> this this lady is not a faithful person she's not reliable she's not dependable there are some men they cannot leave their wives with their friends i've had people tell me that before about some people that i can't leave this man with my wife even though he's a believer in Christ. Ah, what an irony. So faithfulness is a very critical issue of life. And something that is very dear to the heart of God. If you don't want to be faithful, you cannot work with God. The central theme of relationship is like the rubber that binds you and God together. That binds you together. That binds your relationship with Christ together. Is to be faithful to Jesus, to be faithful to the Holy Spirit, to be faithful to God. Faithfulness. Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, who can find a faithful man? That statement is like, it's not, it's not a regret, it's like a lamentation. Ah, it is very difficult. It is so difficult to find someone who is faithful. And Solomon who wrote the book of Proverbs was speaking by the Spirit of God and was saying, it is very hard to find a faithful man faithful man now let's go back to the story we are reading in acts chapter 12 verse 25 paul and barnabas were commissioned by the holy spirit as ministers and so i will come back to that i will come back to that later on in acts chapter 12 verse 25 john mark decided to join paul and mark paul and barnabas it was paul and barnabas that got called but along the way they met with john mark and incidentally John Mark happened to be a cousin to Barnabas. I will tell you later on. I will go back later on. So Mark joined them and they became three. And they were working together. Working together, preaching around. In Acts 13 verse 13, 
Mark pulled out. The Bible says, and John Mark departed from there. That statement is heavy. John Mark departed from there. How many of you want people to depart from you? You think you will be happy when someone whom you trust, someone whom you have given secret into their hand, someone who has eaten with you, someone whom you think will be loyal, and he turns his back at you, will you be happy? And Mark departed from there. Acts 13, 13. Mark departed. That scripture jumped out of the Bible. And the Lord says, this is the word for this Sunday. A lot of unfaithfulness in my church. A lot of unfaithfulness in the world. A lot of unfaithfulness in marriages. A lot of unfaithfulness in businesses, including Christian businesses, Christian marriages, Christian politics, Christian churches. And I want you to go and speak and encourage my people. A faithful man who can find. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 6. Now we have cases where husbands dump their wives. Our wives dump their husbands. If you have given your wife everything as a man, you have shown her true love, you sacrificed for her. When things were bad, when she was sick, when she was not educated, when her family rejected her, you stood by her as a man. And then the woman, after she has grown up, she has become big and rich, and she's claiming to be a believer, and she turns her back at you. How will you feel? It breaks the heart. It ruins reputation. It destroys credibility. It makes a man to even take laws into his hand. We have cases of such in the U.S. A man will bring a woman from, from Africa, and the woman will go to school. She will, he will sponsor the woman. The woman becomes rich or whatever, and the woman turns her back. And when she becomes stable, she dumps the man, and the man will take the law into his hand. Switch it around. If you are a woman, and when your husband was down, your husband was struggling, your husband was poor, your husband was sick, you stood by him, you even borrowed money for him, you even borrowed money for him, your husband's family members threw him away because he gave his life to Christ, and you stood by him, and you helped him, and you labored for him, and the man became great, and the man became a governor, the man became a rich man, and after 10, 20 years, the man is telling you, uh, God is speaking to me that you are not my wife, God is speaking to me that I need to have, so and he comes to be a believer, and he's departing from you how will you feel act 13 13 and mark departed from paul and barnabas we are in a departing generation husbands departing from wives wives departing from husbands how will you feel if you are a faithful pastor we have cases where there are false pastors that people have to leave them which is there's nothing wrong about that and then we have cases where there are faithful pastors that people use and dump. I have had cases of pastors complaining to me when my, my members were poor, when they were struggling. They came to America, they came to Canada, they had nothing. We helped them, we raised them, we supported them, we gave them money, we helped them to do this. If we even helped them to get their visa and to stabilize. As soon as they became great, they became settled, they left our church, went to another church. And the pastor becomes heartbroken. And the pastor becomes heartbroken. And Satan hijacks that process to lead the pastor into unforgiveness, into bitterness, into resentment. And he will lead him out of love. And when you go out of love, you go out of God. When you go out of love, you go out of God. A faithful man who can find. Faithfulness is a real commodity. It is becoming very expensive now in our generation but you must be able to afford it if you don't want to be faithful you cannot please god you cannot serve god you cannot follow god that is one of the strongest character traits of leadership that is one of the greatest value system of leadership faithfulness to be faithful means to be reliable to be dependable to be constant you're always there People can put their back on their bed and sleep and close their two eyes. I trust my assistant. There are some assistants, they are waiting for their superior to go to bed before they strike. There are some husbands, they are waiting for their wives to travel before they go around sleeping around. There are some women, they are waiting, there are some men, they are waiting for their wives to go. The thing is wrecking havoc and damage on our world. And as believers in Christ, we have to go back to the roots. The roots, the art of the matter is the matter of the art. We have to go back to the roots. Faithfulness. A faithful man who can find. How do you feel if you have a lawyer friend? That friend 
You are loyal to that friend. Anytime he has problem, you support him. You give him money. You help him out. The wife was sick in the hospital. They called on you. You borrowed money and you helped them. And then their problems were solved and they became strong and they came together. And when you had problem, you went to your friend and he turns his back at you. How do you feel? It's like a dagger to your heart. It's like a dagger to your heart. A faithful man who can find faithfulness. We are in a use and dump generation. You know, use and dump. Where people are looking for opportunity to use someone and dump them. Use someone and dump them. <laughs> when Jesus was speaking, when Jesus was praying for a particular man who was blind, Jesus put something on his face and said, what can you see? The man said, I see men as trees. Hmm. I see men as trees. What do people use trees for? Trees are used to make papers. Trees are used to make chairs, to make furniture, to make beds. So what does that mean? I see men as something I can use. I see men as something I can use. There are some people, that is how they are. When they meet you, they are looking at you as a tool that they can use to achieve their own purpose. And so those kind of people are not faithful people. They are not people to put your back on. They are not people to open your doors for. They are not people to open your arms for. A faithful man who can find. Jesus said, you are not seeing well. No, no, no. Jesus had to put another thing on his face. I cannot allow you to go like this. You are seeing men as trees. You are seeing men as trees. I can't allow you to go like this. Jesus had to do a second job, a second, a second surgical operation on his eyes. And now he said, I can see men correctly now. That is... Where God wants you to be, you stop seeing people as trees. You stop seeing people as tools. You stop seeing people as beds. You stop seeing people as chairs that you can sit and use. Sit and use. Use and dump. Sit and use. Use and dump. Sit and use. Use and dump. The more you do that, the more you spread the aura of unfaithfulness, the spirit of unfaithfulness. And every seed of unfaithfulness we give back to bountiful harvest of unfaithfulness. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be ye not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Proverbs 20, verse 6 is our anchor scripture. A faithful man who can find. Faithfulness is such a very serious subject that sometimes when people break your heart, people you trust, people you open the door of your heart to, you are sharing a secret with a woman whom you call your wife. You are sharing a secret with your husband and the man went behind you to stab you, to reveal the secret. There are people who take nude pictures of their spouses. They take nude pictures. They, they just took it out of curiosity, out of adventure or whatever. But when they are having crisis and disagreement, they go on the internet and they download and so they upload or whatever and put the problem in, put the woman's, and that is madness. That is, so the person will say, I will kill you today. A lot of people who have killed their spouses because of this matter of unfaithfulness. Not just unfaithfulness in the matter of sexual morality now. I'm talking about unfaithfulness. You are not dependable. You are not reliable. I don't want a lot of crowd. Because having too many people around you is not just blessing all the time. Life is like a triangle. The faithful people are occupying the top of the triangle. If you are doing well, things are fine with you. Money is coming in. You are popular. You are famous. People can get things from you. They can get you to do things for them. That is when you see people bowing down before you and cringing around you. The day a bad news spread about you, you will see the faithful person. That is why Solomon by the Holy Spirit said, who can find a faithful man? God is calling us back to faithfulness. We are living in a critical time. Dangerous, dangerous generation. We are not in the end time. We are in zero time now. There is nothing more that is remaining other than for you and I to go back to our roots and to become faithful. Faithful believers in Christ. Faithful Christians. Faithful Christians. So Barnabas and, and Saul in Acts chapter 13, they were going around their ministry. In Acts 13, 13, Mark joined them initially. Mark pulled back. Acts 13, 13 says, and Mark departed from them. That statement is every duty betrayer. How many people like men to depart from them? Even myself, people have departed from me. People have left our church. And it is very painful. 
It is not easy, particularly when you know you're a good person in court. You're not perfect, but you're a good person in court. And you have not done what is wrong to them. And they use you and dump you and depart. It is very painful. It is very painful. Very, very painful. So John Mark departed. He just departed. He departed. They didn't beg him to join their ministry. He just came and joined Barnabas and Paul. But in that at 13, 13, probably the work became tough and it departed from them. I underline that statement in my Bible. Acts 13, 13, and Mark departed from them. Very, that statement is pregnant with meaning. <laughs> Very pregnant. You know what happened? Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Act 15, 36. Suddenly, Mark came back again. Ah, I want to join you again. And Paul and Barnabas began to fight. The Bible says the contention between them was so sharp that they split. They split. Paul and Barnabas split because of Mark. The unfaithfulness of one Mark caused a destiny relationship to be broken. Don't forget in Acts 13, verse 2, God ordained that relationship. The Bible says, after they had prayed and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work unto which I have called them. That is in Acts 13, verse 2. But because of Mark's unfaithfulness, Mark, sorry, Barnabas and Paul, who were, who were commissioned by God, God said, I have commissioned them. I ordained this ministry. But because of Mark's unfaithfulness, Mark planted the seed of unfaithfulness into that relationship and caused them to split. That was the last time the name of Barnabas was mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. Go and study the scripture very well. You won't find his name mentioned again. Barnabas just went into oblivion. You cannot break a God-ordained relationship and expect that things will be right for you. Paul took Silas. Barnabas took Mark. So from that time, you'll be hearing Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas. So all of the glory, all of the blessing, all of the breakthrough, all of the... All of the lessons, all of the encounters that Paul and Silas had should have been Paul and Barnabas. So invariably, Barnabas missed out of God's agenda for the ministry of Paul. Paul ended up writing more than two-thirds of the New Testament, a feat that himself and Barnabas should have shared of the reward. Look at what unfaithfulness does. Look at what unfaithfulness does. The unfaithfulness of a husband can wreck the destiny of the wife. The unfaithfulness of a wife can wreck the destiny of the husband. The unfaithfulness of the husband can wreck the destiny of the children. The unfaithfulness of the wife can ruin the destiny of the children. It is like a poison. When you take a teaspoon of poison and you put it in a tank of water, 10,000 tons, 10,000 meters of water, and you put a little speck of poison, it poisons the whole water. That is why Jesus said a little leaven leavens the whole law. You don't need a tank full of unfaithful people. You just need only one unfaithful man to poison an entire system. You only need a little unfaithful person, a little unfaithfulness, a little one to poison the whole system. So Solomon saw into the future and by the Holy Spirit, Solomon said, who can find a faithful man? Dr. Jeremiah said, like I said, he said, if you find three faithful people in your lifetime, friends, people that are faithful, he said, you are, you are blessed by God. Three faithful, as in people that you can call on when the road is, is blocked, when your back hits the wall, when there is emergency at 2 a.m. at night, and you need ten thousand dollars, and you have one thousand friends who are very comfortable and rich. How many can you call and say, "My friend, I need ten thousand to do an operation for my child." Now, can you help me? <laughs> you think everybody will give you the money? That is when you will know who is a true friend, who is a dependable friend, who is a reliable friend, who is a trustworthy friend. That is why the subject of faithfulness is extremely critical extremely critical you know what happened <laughs> like i said before mark was a cousin john mark because you see mark and then you see john mark they are the same person 
Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. So it was because Mark was Barnabas' cousin, that was what made Barnabas to be a little bit sentimental and emotional. When Mark left them, and Mark wanted to join them again, Paul said, no, this guy is an unfaithful man. I have had enough of him. I don't want him to break my heart again. It's like a woman leaving a man. After three years, you are coming back again. Or a man leaving his wife, dumping her, and then coming back. You think it's easy to take him back? Even if you will take him back, you have to prove him very well. I had the story of a man and a woman. The woman was very rich. She was into construction. She had a lot of money. The husband was just a salary earner. And the man began to envy the wife. This kind of envy. I, I tell my wife, I want you to be a billionaire. I want you to be a billionaire. Because even when she's not a billionaire, and she's going out of the house, I am the one begging her, don't buy anything when you're coming. I don't need an extra shoe. I don't need an extra, don't buy anything. And even after telling her that she'll call me in the shop, I, I saw this t-shirt, I saw this jacket, I said, I said I don't want anything. Now, so I already know that if she becomes a billionaire, I will really want to enjoy the money because there is nothing I want she won't give me. There was a time she was working that she gave me a, a debit card. She was, she, 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 I was traveling to a particular part of the UK, where the UK at that time, she was working in Scotland, I was living in England, she would give me a debit card to keep while I was in England. <laughs> I wasn't remote controlling her, I wasn't manipulating her, <laughs> but that is a good wife. That this, she knew I was having problems financially that time, so she said, no, 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 just be, just be fine. Just make sure you, you, you take care of yourself, myself and, and your, our child, we're going to be fine. I said, no, 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 she said, no, just keep my card. So if she becomes a billionaire, she's going to buy a house for me. So when you see a man who is jealous or who is blocking the woman from progressing, I begin to wonder, what is going on here? It is only when a man has married a bad woman and a woman has married a bad man, that is when that kind of thing happens. <laughs> so this man was becoming jealous of the, of the wife. The wife was getting big projects, big contract done. Then the wife became sick. The wife became sick, so the wife could not sign checks. The wife could not supervise her project. And she said, ah, if I cannot do it, I have a husband. And she, she gave her husband a checkbook and she signed all the checkbooks. She didn't put any figure. She gave him, he gave him, a, she gave him a blank check and told the man, just be paying all the contractors, just be helping me um, to supervise the project. And the man said, oh, that's fine, that's fine. Three months after, they discharged that woman from the hospital. And all, as she went to supervise, she went to inspect a building project, the one she was doing on behalf of a, of a company. This thing was at a standstill. Ah, what's going on here? And she called all the contractors. They said, we were not paid. Ah, you weren't paid? What is the problem here? And the husband began to, began to stammer. And the woman was heartbroken. Ah, my husband. So all the check I signed. You stole the money, you withdrew the money. My old husband, ah, what do you want that you cannot get? It's, my money is your money. But at least pay the contractors. The man began to beg the wife. They went to their church. They called the pastor of their church. And he is a Christian. The man is a believer in Christ. Regrettably. After much persuasion, the woman accepted the man. They reconciled. You know what happened? Six months or there about down the line, the woman got sick again. And so they felt that that sickness was relapsing. <laughs> was relapsing. And they admitted the woman to the hospital. And the woman was, 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 she was dr drying up. She was drying up. And at the point of death, they ran so many tests and discovered that there was poison in her system. And by the time they got the police involved, the woman said they should go and arrest her husband. And they tortured the man. The man confessed. The man poisoned the wife. She accepted that back the second time. And she paid for it. The man, the woman poisoned, the man poisoned the wife because of properties and buildings and cars. So someone who has been unfaithful to you, who has stabbed you once, when they are coming back the second time, you want to prevent that. Say no. Even if it is me, I will say no. I, I still love you, my brother. But we can't do business together. Even with me, I've said it before to someone. I love you, my brother. For let me hug you. We cannot do anything together. I don't trust you again. That was what happened between Paul and Barnabas. And Mark. Mark betrayed their trust for the first time. Mark abandoned them and went away. Acts 13, 13. And Mark departed from them. 
Mark came back again, Acts 13, 35. Paul said, I don't want this anymore. No, 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 no. You know what happened? <laughs> and they separated. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 to 11. Colossians 4, 10 to 11, it was Dr. John MacArthur that did a study on this story. <laughs> Paul was in prison. It was a Roman prison. And Paul was writing a letter. And Paul included the name of Mark among the apostles that took care of him, that remembered him. And Paul was commending Mark. So Bible scholars were saying, ah, the same Mark that Paul was having problem with many years back, what has changed in the life of Mark? Why did Paul commend Mark again years later? Eventually, we discovered that Apostle Peter discipled Mark eventually. Mark was not discipled. He was still very immature. So when he began to walk with Barnabas and Paul, he faced some challenges in ministry and he pulled back because he wasn't mature. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter called Mark my son. Peter discipled and mentored Mark. Peter himself had been a betrayer. Peter denied Jesus. Peter understands what unfaithfulness can do to a man's destiny. Peter understands what unfaithfulness can do to a nation. In fact, Peter even understands what unfaithfulness did to Judas. That if care is not taken, we can lose Mark. So, Peter, Apostle Peter, brought Mark closer to himself, mentored Mark, discipled Mark, and Mark became a formidable apostle to the extent that God Almighty gave Mark the privilege to be part of the apostles who will write the New Testament. He gave him the privilege, and Paul himself commended Mark that Mark is a faithful brother after many years. What does that tell us? This story tells us. Look at what happened to Barnabas. Barnabas lost out in the equation. Barnabas lost his ministry that was ordained by God because of the unfaithfulness of one man. But later on, the man that was unfaithful, the man that was responsible for someone else's loss of ministry, the man eventually came back on track. The man eventually had a place in the agenda of God. Look at how life plays out. Look at how life plays out. That is the moral reason you and I have to be very, very careful. Do not sow the seed of unfaithfulness. You don't know whose destiny may be tied to it. You don't know whose destiny may be tied to it. Any opportunity you have before you, be loyal to people. You don't have to break somebody else's church to build your own. You don't have to break someone else's marriage to get a good man. If you do so, you sow the seed of unfaithfulness. And let me not deceive you. The Bible says, be ye not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. People don't reap exactly what they sow. They reap more than what they sow. Barnabas was the one that now became the weeping ball. It was supposed to be Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul. Now it became Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas. Barnabas, God ordained that relationship. Acts 13 verse 2. Separate me Paul and Barnabas for the work I have called them to do. But the unfaithfulness of one brother messed up that relationship to the extent that the name of Barnabas was removed from the act of the apostles. Barnabas ended his, 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 his visibility in Acts 13. Acts 13 is the last chapter in the book of Acts where the name of Barnabas was mentioned. He simply went into oblivion. He simply went into because of your unfaithfulness. That is why you and I have to be very you don't have to break, destroy somebody else's business to build your own. The cloud is too big to accommodate everyone. Have you ever seen two birds? Have you ever seen birds that fell down and died and they are asking them what killed you? And they say we collided. The sky is too wide. When God called us to start our church after we had done itinerant ministry and I, I, had, I was talking to someone and the person was telling me, you cannot start a church without having people support you from other churches. I said, I don't want other people's members. I don't want, it was myself and my wife. I want other sisters. Three people. <laughs> it was very difficult. 
I said, I don't want it. The same church that we were before as ministers, I can go there now anytime I like. When I enter the place, they hug me. We play together. We laugh together because this man didn't destroy our church. He didn't steal people. I wasn't writing letters to people and say, come, come, come and follow us. I wasn't whispering to them. I said, no, I can preach very well. Come, because whatever I sow, I will reap. You break somebody else's marriage to build your own, expect it to happen. Grace has covered it. Lie. <laughs> Forget it. Except Apostle Paul, the writer of grace. Tell me someone who wrote more, more, than, more than Paul about grace. All the book of Romans, 90% of Romans focused on grace. It was Paul that set the pace. For the message of grace, the same Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Be ye not deceived. As it's like Paul knew people will be deceived in the end time. They will come and be saying all kinds of things. Don't let them deceive you. Whatsoever you sow, you will reap. So you cannot take Paul's messages and focus on the easier, softer, sweeter version of his messages and throw away the other ones. You have to balance scriptures. If you teach a quarter of scriptures that is called dishonesty, you have to balance scripture, take everything together in the New Testament. And I'm always very focused on using New Testament scriptures because people will say that is Old Testament. So I concentrate my teaching on New Testament. <laughs> Listen to this. So we have a world that is full of unfaithful people. Sometimes I ask questions. Are these people born again? What do they understand by the word, I am born again? It is the most abused statement in the whole world. It is the most bastardized statement in the whole world. The Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. There must be transformation in your behavior. People must be able to keep money with you and meet it the same way they kept it without anything touching that money. People must be able to borrow you money and there will not be any regret. They, ah, you borrowed brother James' money. Ah, you have given him a gift. You have given him a gift. Forget. And I was curious. I asked the Holy Spirit, why is the subject of faithfulness so critical to you? So it is not just critical to God. Satan himself uses it as a weapon. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 2. In the last days, perilous time shall come. Men shall be unfaithful. If you read it in King James, you won't get a picture. I always check like seven, eight versions. Before I do any teaching, I check seven, eight versions. King James, New King James, and New Living Translation, Good News Bible, Amplified Bible. I check them and I compare their tenses. If I am not clear, and the thing is not very clear, I go on Google. And I'll go and pull out the Greek lexicon. The Greek lexicon is the library of words used to write the New Testament. Because the New Testament was written in Greek. So I have to check the original Greek. What was in the mind of the Greek scribes? The scribes that wrote those scriptures. And when I see it, I say, hmm. So I saw what Paul was saying. Men shall be unfaithful. Men shall be unfaithful in the last days. He didn't say unbelievers will be unfaithful. He said men, which could include believers and unbelievers. <laughs> men shall be unfaithful in the last days. The reason why we have have the multiplication of unfaithfulness among believers, Christians, believers, believing husbands, believing wives, bishops, apostles, pastors, of churches, big churches, small churches, white churches, black churches. There is a spirit of unfaithfulness released by Satan into the atmosphere. People just do not want to be loyal. People just do not want to be loyal. They just don't want to do it. It's like being disloyal is a mark of strength. If I am too loyal, he will think I am weak. I have to show him that, me too, I have my own mind and I can do whatever I like. That is not the mind of Christ. <laughs> The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. 
and took upon himself the form of a man and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death on the cross wherefore God also has highly exalted him exaltation came after he had humbled himself it is not after he has humbled him it's not after he has been exalted and he humbled himself he had his own mind God didn't force him John chapter 14 Verse 30, he said, the, the prince of this world cometh and find nothing in me. And find nothing. That's nothing in me. Nothing in me. <laughs> Jesus said, he said, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life of my own accord. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. He was not forced to die on the cross. He wasn't forced. He was just faithful. Hebrews chapter 13, listen to this. Hebrews 3 verse 2 said, Jesus was faithful to him that appointed him. I'm going to die for them and I will die for them. It's my choice. If, Jesus had, if he had changed his mind, the father would never have stopped him. So there is a general spirit of unfaithfulness. Where am I going? Faithfulness itself is a spirit. Faithfulness is a spirit. How did I know? Galatians chapter 5 verse 21. The Bible says, For the, for the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Faithfulness. The fruit of the spirit. So one of the fruit of the spirit is faithfulness. Everything produces after its kind. The child of a dog is dog or puppy. <laughs> the child of goat is goat. The child of a lion is baby lion or cub is lion. So if the fruit of the spirit is faithfulness, it means faithfulness itself is a spirit. It's like you are plucking a fruit from the tree of spirit. So anything you pluck from the tree of spirit must carry the same nature of that tree. So on the tree of spirit, we have love, joy, peace, long suffering, faithfulness. So faithfulness is a spirit provoked, fermented by the only spirit, the chief engineer himself. That is why every believer in Christ must aspire to bear fruit and pray about it and walk in it and grow in it before that fruit can manifest and bear more fruit. That is why Satan can do it so quickly and spread unfaithfulness around the world. Because it's a spirit. It's a spirit. How do we become faithful? How do we become faithful? Let me check my time. How do we become faithful? Faithfulness is a spirit. It can be cultivated deliberately by praying. If you are a believer in Christ and you are born again, praying, studying, and doing the word. Praying, studying, and doing the word. The more you pray, the more you study scripture and do what you study. You cultivate. It's like a farm, a big farm full of wheat you cultivate it because the scriptures are not just logos jesus said in john 6 63 the words i speak to you are spirits alive so when you read the bible it's not just chemistry as book you are reading on the surface it is logos letters beneath that letter is spirit so the more you read and not just reading you are doing it the spirit in those letters will enter you and will be strengthening you renewing your mind Renew your mind. The Bible is full of, there is no principle of life that is not in scripture. Hard work is there. Discipline is there. Faithfulness is there. Integrity is there. Truth is there. Obedience is there. So when you are reading those scripture and you are doing it, you are reading it and you are doing it and you are praying, oh Lord, help me today to be a faithful believer. Please help me today. Please help me today. I am tempted to do anything anybody wants to do that is evil. There is no Christian that is free from temptation. I am always tempted like everyone about it. Everybody is tempted too. <laughs> what is it that helps some of us, my listeners today, to avoid temptations? Not because you are perfect. Sometimes when you are tempted to steal, when you have need, I'm a believer in Christ. No. There is an internal power 
supernatural empowerment that said no, I would rather go hungry than steal. <laughs> I won't do it. No, I won't do it. Someone else will see it and say it's my weakness. God will forgive me, and he claims to be a believer. If you check that person's life very well, he doesn't pray, he doesn't study, he's not, he spent 25 hours on Facebook every day. You will be world champion carnal Christian. You will be very flat. Your spiritual tire will be flat. And when the tires of a car are flat, the car is grounded, moving nowhere, going nowhere. So when you see a lot of believers that are grounded, the tires of their spiritual life are flat. Flat tires everywhere. You cannot do anything in this kingdom without praying and studying the scripture. The people that are serving Satan, the, the, the um, Hindus, the Buddhists, they have their own book they are reading. They read those books, the Chinese do meditation. They do, um, they read and they are consulting spirit. And you say, oh, they don't pray, they don't fast. No, <laughs> don't deceive yourself. When they intermingle with those spirits and demons, they receive inspiration and then they, then they go into the lab and begin to invent things in the lab. Majority of them are in so all kind of demonic occultic covenant, illuminati, and all kind of stuff they are doing. <laughs> Where they are connected and cultivating supernatural powers. Because this world is under the under the umbrella of Satan. Psalm 74, verse 20 says, Our respect to the covenant for the dark places of the heart are full of the habitation of cruelty. The dark place, the earth is full of cruel people, wickedness, demonic activities. So sometimes you want to be faithful, a particular force is pulling it away from you. That is where prayer and study of scripture and sometimes fasting comes in. That is why a believer must not just be carnal and see things from the natural standpoint all the time. There are things your mind can handle. There are things your mind can never handle, no matter how brilliant you are. That you will need the mind of God, the superior mind of God to undo that matter. So number one, you cultivate faithfulness. Number two, surround yourself with faithful people. That one is very heavy. Surround yourself with faithful people. If your best friends are unfaithful, you are a woman and your best friend is a woman that divorced a husband without any reason no justifiable reason other than greed he met she met another man who is rich and dumped her husband and that's your best friend very soon you will do it very soon you will do it the bible says he that walks with the wise shall be wise a companion of fools shall be destroyed you can never be more faithful than the quality of people that surround you. If your best friends are loyal people, faithful to their husbands, faithful to their wives, faithful to their bosses at work, and faithful to God, let me tell you, you'll be faithful. <laughs> that was one of the things that helped me when I was growing up in Christ. God gave me a holy start and surrounded me with faithful brethren. Faith people who will not condone you. I cannot go and tell them that I mistakenly slapped somebody. They will tell me go and fast for 30 days. They will tell you, you are going to hell. <laughs> Even though they took things to the extreme, but they did not spare me. And thank God that the Holy Spirit gave me a teachable heart. I wasn't saying these people are too tough. <laughs> Faithful friends. That is why I don't have up to five friends as a close friend now very intimate people maybe three of them and i can tell you what they are doing now as i'm talking i'm not god i can tell you this man is doing this thing now <laughs> if anybody comes and tell me this man slept with another woman i say it's a lie you can't do it now is it because he's not a human being that can make mistakes of course we can all make mistakes but i know this man except you rape him he won't do it <laughs> i have tested him for years Except you rape him, he will not do it. That is the same thing that they say about me too, to the glory of God. Not by my power now, to the glory of God. There are things they will say I do, say, ah, I know he can do it. Maybe when he's weak, he can do it. But this one, no, not that he cannot do it. <laughs> I trust him, he cannot do it. Surround yourself with faithful people. First Samuel chapter 22, verse 2. First Samuel. So, 2 verse 2, 
David started his ministry as a king. The Bible says the weak, the poor, the unfaithful, the, the, the disloyal, all the bad, bad people, they surrounded David. That is 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. Second Samuel chapter 10, verse 7. The Bible says, And David's mighty men, and David's mighty men, ah, what has happened? Between second, between first Samuel 22, verse 2, when they were unfaithful, disloyal, bad, and they surrounded themselves with David, and second Samuel 10, verse 7, what happened? What a transformation. The unfaithful people became faithful. Why? They banded themselves with a man that was faithful. David, a man after God's heart. One of the most faithful human beings that have gra graced this planet earth was David. God himself was boasting to the house of Saul. He said, I took my mercy away from the house of Saul, but I retained it in the house of my servant. My servant, my faithful servant, David. <laughs> so when those unfaithful men banded themselves with David, the faithfulness of David impacted them. So if you are looking for the best ways to make a man to be faithful, who is bad and unfaithful, let him be mentored by a very faithful man. Now that is a contextual statement because I said, don't surround yourself with unfaithful people. But within the context of being a helper to people now, be mentors to people. I'll get there now. God can use you to transform people's unfaithfulness to faithfulness. One day, a woman came to me and said, her husband is useless. Her husband is horrible. Ah, this man is this. I said, ah, I sympathize with her. I said, can he be my friend? The woman began to laugh. He said, you don't know my husband. Ah, he's so bad. I pleaded with her. I said, let him be my friend for six months. Let him be my friend for six months. <laughs> the woman didn't listen to me because she wrote she wrote off her husband that he can never change. I said, because by the time we are friends, I will send five books to him to read. I'll just give him five books. Five books. They are enough. After he has finished reading it, the time me and, me and him will be talking, he won't hear me talk about woman. He won't hear me talk about stealing. It will, the only thing you'll be hearing, if it is not business, you'll be hearing the gospel. You'll be hearing salvation. You'll be hearing eternity. If he remains my friend for six months and he doesn't change. Not, be, not because I'm the one who will change him. Not because I'm the Holy Spirit. I am saying that if you surround yourself with people who are faithful, because faithfulness is a spirit, the virtue, the values can be transferred. So, like, my wife looks at my friends. If she sees any friend around me, she tells me, of course, she knows I won't have bad, I won't have bad friends. But even within pastors, she picks, oh, you know, women have the top sense. This pastor is genuine, but the way he's doing, I don't trust him. I say, ah, 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 this man, the man of God is very good. I don't trust him. Eventually, it comes to pass. <laughs> the women have that, that gift. <laughs> they have that gift. And sometimes when I see some people, maybe some of our friends that they've known in the past, said, ah, this woman, this woman that is, I'm not comfortable, you can't be friends with her. You can't be friends. You can just wave your hands and greet her, get, keep her at arm's length, because show me your friend, I will tell you who you are. By the time somebody who is changing husbands every year becomes your best friend, someone who is slapping her husband becomes your best friend, and she's justifying it. Or by the time someone who is beating his wife becomes your best friend. And it's not like you're mentoring him now to change. It's your friend. You are at the same level. Ah, you will do it very soon. You will complain about your wife to him one day and he will tell you, Woman, piece of shit. What do you mean? You are taking a woman's matter as serious as that. You slap her and you, and, and you ask her to... Don't you know that there are men who think like that? <laughs> I used to have somebody like that in the past, many years ago. Anytime you tell him about your wife. I wasn't married that time. I, mean, I think I was married. So when one of our friends was complaining about his wife to him, he said, how can you accept that from a woman? I know myself. I cannot try it. I will deal with her. <laughs> when my friend got married, when one day they had crisis, 
they met him on his knees, begging the wife. Ah, sweetheart, please, 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 don't, don't, don't spoil my life. Don't spoil my life. I've been begging you for the past three hours. What else do you want? Please, what else do you want? Please, please, don't let people hear. Okay, 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 I will not do it again. Please, ah, I said, but you said you cannot take this nonsense. Uma, that is how life is. I cannot take it. I will never take it. They are doing more than that. That is why you have to be careful. Not to allow other people's unfaithfulness to ruin your own faithfulness. Because faithfulness is contagious. Very contagious. <laughs> Number three. How do you become faithful as a believer in Christ? Now I'm speaking to believers who are born again now. Start becoming faithful in little, little things. Before you become faithful in big, big things. Little gestures. Become faithful in little, little things. Luke 19 verse 17. He that is faithful in what is little. Much will be committed into his hands. Little, little things. Number one. Start keeping promises. I will be at your house at 2 p.m. Don't leave your house at 2. Because if you do, you will get there at 3. And that is what my wife knows me about. I don't play with time. My brain is wired with time consciousness. I will get there at 1.55 waiting for you. You will be the one to meet me there. I will give you that money. Monday morning by 4 p.m. Make sure the money is there by 3.58 p.m. Those little gestures of faithfulness will come together as a pie, a mass of faithfulness. He that is faithful in little, much will be committed to his hands. There is a former Navy SEAL in the United States. Navy SEAL. His name is Austin Mark Raven. Austin, no, Mark Raven. Austin McRaven. Now, he was invited to speak to the graduating class of uh, University of Texas some years back. So, Austin McRaven mounted the, puppy, the, the podium and you can see graduates, well-dressed and they were asking him to tell them the secret of becoming the greatest person in the world. How do I conquer the world? You are a Navy SEAL. You have seen the greatest crisis, the greatest trouble fighting battles all over the world. And you are still alive. You are a successful person. Tell us, we younger ones, we want to learn from you. Austin McRaven <clears throat> cleared his throat and said, you want to become very great. You want to conquer the whole world. Conquer the whole world. Let me tell you the secret. Start making your bed when you wake up every morning. Start making your bed <laughs> when you wake up every morning. If you are not faithful in making your bed, <laughs> you cannot be faithful in big things. The little, little effort of two, three minutes of doing your bed and your pillow and laying it will gather enough dust, enough kinetic energy and gather them together and equip you with the capacity to be faithful in big things. Start making your bed. Start making your bed. <laughs> Make your bed in the morning. And then you'll be faithful in big things. Little, little promises. There is a man of God called John Wesley. One of the greatest, 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 greatest preachers that the United Kingdom produced. One day John Wesley was asked, John Wesley, if you know you are going to die tomorrow morning by 8 a.m., what will you do? They were asking John Wesley today. John Wesley, you are going to die tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Now, tomorrow is Monday now. So you're going to die tomorrow morning by 8 a.m. What will you do? John Wesley said, <clears throat> I will go to Sister Mary's house today by 2 p.m. to have a lunch with her and her daughter because I promised her I was coming. 4 p.m. I will be in the library to return the books I borrowed last week. I told them I was coming. 9 p.m. I will be at the men's fellowship and do the last Sunday school session that we have to do for tonight. And then I'll go back home and rest and then 8 a.m., go on my bed, close my eyes, and wait for God to take me home. Did you hear that? What did he mean? Even that I know that I am going to die at a particular time, 
will not reduce my commitment to faithfulness. Everything that I have said I will do, I will still do, regardless of death. Boy, that is a man our generation needs. Even death is too small to take me away from my focus on faithfulness. I will not change my mind. I borrowed some books last week. I return them today for some people. Hey, I'm, I will die tomorrow. Ah, the whole the whole city is is the whole country knows somebody is about to die tomorrow. And you cancel all your plans and agenda, cancel everything because the man over time has been faithful in little little things. So telling him he's going to die is good news because he's going to heaven. <laughs> he's going to heaven. Little, little things. You borrow money from people, return it at the right time. I have told us this story many times. I had problems some years back. Very serious financial problem. <laughs> it was so tough and I didn't have money. And I have a friend in the US. That's, I'm talking to you about 15 years ago now. I had a friend in the US. And one of my brothers said, talk to your friend. Your friend is rich. I said, no. No, 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 no. I can't talk to him. I said, I cannot be asking him for money. You know that kind of feeling? I know. He, he was in pride. Don't get me wrong. He had helped me before. And so I felt, I cannot be going to him with my problem every time. No. My brother said, in the worst case scenario, we tell you no. He will say no. So I summoned up courage and I sent him an email. I was expecting him to say, ah, uh -uh, what is it? I helped you two years ago. Are you the only one? And my friend said, oh my God. Because I explained my case to him. He said, this is a very serious case. He said, I'm going to help you. But I'm not going to give you the money. I will borrow you the money. I think he gave me $800 or so. I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't have $10. <laughs> I, I'm talking about a time that I didn't have $10 in my account. That was nothing. No food in the house. Nothing. I wanted to travel and buy ticket, and I mean, it was messed up. Said, so send me your account details. I sent him the account. He did the transfer. The second or third day, I got the money. I was so happy. I prayed for him. And I said, when should I return? He said, I know you don't have money now. Just hold on. Suck out your problem. When, you, when you're working or when you get money, send it back to me. So about two months, three months after, I will send him messages. He will tell me, don't worry, don't worry. Take your time. Six months after, say take your time. And one year after I moved to Europe, he said, You're just coming to Europe. You, have, you, you need to settle down. Take your time. Two years after, say, take your time. I said, But you borrow me, you didn't give me. He said, No, yes, I bought, I bought, I didn't give you, but don't rush. I want to be sure that you are settled. <laughs> so I forgot about it. About three years after, he just sent me a mail one day. He said, Are you okay now? Are you able to send the money? I said, I, I'm not okay now. He said, okay, don't worry, 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 take your time. Third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, 2011 or 2012, if I'm not mistaken, 2013 and 13. That was eight years after he borrowed me the money, $800. I just saw his email one day. <laughs> he said, I can see now that you are okay. <laughs> that you are okay. I said, this man, how do you know I'm okay? I am still trusting God for money. But obviously, I knew what he was saying. I was very much completely different from what I was going through that time. Things had improved. I mean, things were going on fire that time, relatively. He said, please, remember the time that you had a need. Will you be able to send the money back to me? Eight years after. He said it to me in the morning. That was like 8, 9 p.m. I'm sorry, in the, in the morning. I think that was 10 a.m. in the morning. I... As soon as I saw his mail, my heart sank. I said, ah, I shouldn't even allow him to remind me. The following morning, I went to the bank. I asked him for his account details in the US. I did a wire transfer to him. And he thanked me and said, thank you so much for keeping the word. It was like they poured, they put liquid paraffin on my body. The soothing I felt, I said, wow, Lord, thank you that I was a faithful person. The next year, no. Two years after, I had something to do in the U.S., so I went to Atlanta. When I got to Atlanta, I was staying with a friend, and he, I called him. He said, where am I? I said, oh. So he and his wife, they prepared for me. When I got to their house, it was like a feast. They set the table. 
talking from a plate. I was taking chicken from that plate. As they respect, I say, God. Now, what am I saying? If I had replied this mail, who do you think you are? How much did you give me? Because at that, as at that time, by, grace, by God's grace, I had quite access to some money. And how much did you give me? Why are you disturbing me? Is it, is it, is it $800? I will give you 900 I will have 100 on top of it. Hmm. I would have sowed the seed of unfaithfulness that I will reap in bountiful harvest. Someone else will do it to me. And the way we do it, the blara that I will get from that person will be worse. Because the same measure you used to measure, that is not what you will receive. You will sow a seed of corn. You will reap an awful bag of corn. They received me today. We are friends, and I will call him. Where are you? Anytime I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm in America. I will call him. Where are you? And the respect that he has for me has not doing with one. <laughs> Let me not deceive you. And I have helped people not once, not twice, that they turn back and stab me because I'm a child of God, I'm a believer, and a minister of God. I'm not a minister of causes of uh, uh, God will judge you, God will punish you, God will destroy you. I will even be praying for that person because when people sow a seed, they will reap it. <laughs> you don't have to say anything. They will reap the seed. It's only by the mercy of God. God is a merciful God and God can change situation, but the forgiveness of God is more merciful than the loss of sowing and reaping. <laughs> you borrow money from people, if you cannot pay it back, I'm sorry. Somebody said, why is it that when you borrow money from you, the same tone of voice that they will use to return the money. It's not the same tone they used to borrow the money. When you borrow money, you say, oh, please, my friend, Sister Chinwe, please, go have mercy on you. Please, my sister. Oh, please, you can help me. I have not fed. My children have not eaten for the past three days. If you can just give me 100 pounds, please, I will. That is the tone I used to borrow the money. When I will return it, Sister Chinwe, what is it? Is it 100 dollars or 100 pounds? Take your money. Are they the two? Are they, two, are they similar to <laughs> when you wanted to borrow it? You were a gentle person. You wanted to return it. You became a tout. That is the way a lot of people behave. That is not supposed to be for us as believers in Christ. Anything you borrow from people, you cannot pay it back. I am sorry. The Bible says a wicked man borrows and does not pay back. <laughs> When you say wicked, you think about who kills people. is a wicked man. A wicked man borrows. He doesn't pay back. <laughs> he doesn't pay back. Little, little act of faithfulness. We build up a mass of record of faithfulness that will strengthen and ground you well on the foundation of faithfulness. So 20 years after, you have overcome, you have, you have seen people's money, you have returned it. Somebody borrowed money to you, returned it. You promised to come to somebody's house at 2 p.m. You got there at 1 p.m. You have been faithful on literally two things. After 10, 20 years, you have become a strong person. Now, when you are presented with bigger things, bigger things to test your faithfulness, it will be cheap for you. You don't want to start from the mountain when you are struggling in the valley. You want to start from the mountain but you are still struggling in the valley. It doesn't work like that. You are still struggling with $10, 10 pounds, that you cannot return to the owners. And then you are given the opportunity to, to change a figure, to make 10 million pounds. Without hesitation, you will do it. You will do it. <laughs> Let me tell you what changed the life of Joseph. Even in the time of ferocious pain, Joseph was inside a Middle East prison. Archaeologists tell us that a typical Middle East prison is about four feet, five inches high. So Joseph, who was more than five feet, seven inches, was in that prison bowed. He was bowed. Imagine being in a prison, you are bowed. Look at the pain on his back. Look at the pain he was going through, torture. He was bowed like this. <laughs> it was in that environment somebody came to him and said, I have a dream. I have a dream. What would he have said? That was Joseph's greatest test. If Joseph had failed that test, he would never be prime minister. God said in his heart, I will test Joseph. I will test him. Will he be faithful to me? Even inside this painful experience. Ah, 
the day that revelation came to me from a man of God, I cringed. I said, God, please help me. Many, many times I have been under pain and you want to break. Sometimes those pains are tests. Will Joseph be faithful to me? Will he proclaim my faithfulness? If it were to be many of us, you say, you have a dream. Me too, I have a dream. Dreams don't come true. Forget it. Forget it. That would have sealed the destiny. That would be a nail on the coffin of Joseph. He would die in that prison. Because that guy will leave that prison. He will not report to Pharaoh and say there's a man in the prison. And Joseph will die there. Will Joseph be faithful to me even in the time of pain? Do you think Joseph began from there? Joseph began from the palace of Potiphar. You cannot be faithful on the mountain when you are unfaithful in the valley. It doesn't work like that. Joseph was faithful in the palace of Potiphar. Sleep with me. Sleep with me. The guy said no. So when he got into the pit, and things were harder in the pit, these were harder in the prison, it was easy for him because he had overcome a particular experience of unfaithfulness in the past. And so you could undo a bigger thing that was coming in the future. That is why I said, the Lord said to me when I was doing this preparation, tell my people to be faithful in little matters. You may not be very, very powerful and very, very strong to undo great temptation as a believer because we are all growing to maturity. But if you work with God in little steps, don't dream of covering 30 steps at a time. Don't sleep. You, have, you see one pound. When I see money on the road, I will pick it. I will go and give it to people. I will go to shopping malls. I will see purses. Purses of people in the shop. I will pick it. I will go, I'm not saying this to you to let you know that I'm a perfect person. I don't make mistakes. <laughs> but God is helping me. I will pick the purse. I will go and return it. I return one one day. The white people look at me like this. The customer service people. Ah, what kind of man is this? I did another one about about five months or there about to go, and the lady said, "Ah, he called the other guy in the store. He said, look at this man. They thought all black men are criminals." I said, "I saw this debit, this credit card or this." Ah. The day they offered me opportunity to make money, Emma, somebody called me from Nigeria and said I should give them my, my, my account details so they can wire money from somebody's account in the U.S. and then I will make money from it. I just smiled. I said, "I didn't start today." <laughs> It was very easy for me without hesitation. I said, No, I am not part of it. I am not a frost. I'm a believer in Christ. I'm a man of God. I can't do it. If I had been taking people's purses, taking credit card from there, stealing their money, I would say, Ah, this is a big time now. And I won't tell anybody. I will say, It's God's blessing. You will see me on Facebook preaching, wearing this designer suit, flying all over the world, doing military and crusades. And my foundation is on faithfulness. That is a big problem we have in our generation. I was talking to a brother last week. I said, is there nothing called the fear of God again in the heart of men? How can you claim to be believers and you have just come, you just left a woman, you are just coming on top of a woman and you jump straight to the altar to preach and carry the microphone. Just two minutes distance, you left the room and then you jump. There's no fear. What if you die on the altar? Something can happen to you. You're just taking God for granted. <laughs> I and and even when he, the person is doing it, and the pastor friends of his know he's doing it, they are uh, God's servant, God is God's servant, <laughs> it's part of his weakness. The grace of God covers it, and <laughs> and God is doing like this in them, shaking his like this. <sighs> little little things appreciate little gestures, little gestures. Thank you to people, no matter how small the money is. Somebody asks you for money, 50,000 naira. Um, um, you, you ask someone to give 50,000 naira, he gives you 5,000 naira. Say, what is it that's given me? Is it what I want from you? Is it what I want from you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. In my language, they will tell you, there is a way to say, I am sorry. <laughs> In a masculine way. And I am sorry. In a feminine way. No, I am sorry, my sister. Sister Chinwe, Sister Lillian, I am very sorry. That is a feminine way of saying it. Masculine way. Sister Lillian, I'm sorry. I am sorry. I have said it twice. Haven't you heard me? I'm sorry. If somebody tells you that and someone else comes to you and says, I am sorry, my sister. Please, I'm sorry. 
which one is endearing to you? <laughs> Little gestures. Thank you. I got your call. I'm sorry I couldn't reply to the message. Those little things is because people don't take those little things like that is why Mark Raven told the graduating set of Texas University, you want to conquer the whole world, start conquering your bed every morning. <laughs> Make your bed every morning. If those little things are not done, you will not grow and mature. And you won't be strong enough to handle bigger things. That is why Jesus said, he that is unfaithful in little things, no one will give them big things. Because you won't be able to manage it. It's a principle. It's a principle. They use this principle in management. Your boss will not make you the director of a project if you mismanage little, little projects. It is when they see what you have done. They see your antecedents. Your antecedents. You have managed projects very well in the past. Then they take you and put you on top. Number four. Always do things well when you are not being monitored. Don't wait for people to monitor you and then you are doing it well. It's called to do to to that's a word you use for it. Um it skip my mind now. High service, high service, and that is common among Africans. I'm not saying why people don't do it, but it's common common among us, particularly among the politicians. <laughs> they will tell you everything they will do, but when they get there, nothing is done. <laughs> there is a man called Michel Angelo. Michel Angelo is widely regarded as the world's greatest painter. He was a painter. Google his name. One day, Michel Angelo and his servants they got a contract to go and paint the roof of a church. There was nobody in that church, so they got the contract to paint the roof. And so they entered the church, they were painting the roof. Painting the roof. And they got to a particular corner of the roof. That corner of the roof, it wasn't open to the whole congregation. If you enter the church, you will see that corner. It's in a remote part of the building. And Michelangelo stayed there and spent a longer time brushing it, painting it, brushing it. And the servant said he was so angry. Why are you wasting time on a part of a roof that no one will see? Michelangelo said, God will see. Did you hear that? <laughs> Why are you wasting time on a part of a of a roof that no one will see? The man said, God will see. Ah, that thing touched me to my bones. He that is faithful in the little things. See why God doesn't entrust a lot of believers with bigger open doors. And you pray, 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 pray. Ah, my whole life is very hard. My life is very hard. All my friends that are Christians, I even regret being a Christian. When I was an unbeliever, things were very soft for me. No. Maybe you have been unfaithful in little things. And God doesn't want to destroy you. Because God will not open bigger doors. God will not em empower you with bigger experiences, bigger revelation. You just see only one vision, one dream. And then you go on Facebook, you're abusing all the people, abusing believers, abusing pastors. Just one little vision. Say, God, show me tonight. And, and God... God Ask greater things to show you about the world. <laughs> one, man, one, day, one, one man of God said, if God show you a revelation, it's not that everything he shows you, you go on the road, you carry a megaphone, you tell people. There are times God shows you something, it's for your consumption alone. Sometimes it's for prayer alone. So when God shows a revelation and gives you a vision, something will happen next Monday, and you go out to announce it, so that God can humiliate and humble you. He will make sure that it doesn't happen. And people will not call you false prophet. <laughs> ah, that thing touched me. He said, be careful. It's not everything God tells you you announce to the whole world. From that time, God will show me a vision about a country, about people. I will sit down and I will be praying. I say, I don't know if this thing should be public. Oh, because God will not trust you again with something bigger. There are things for public consumption. There are things for private consumption. If you make, make what is private public, uh, or you make what is public private, God will not trust you. He want you to outgrow that face. So I can trust this boy now. Do things when people are not watching you. Do it well. Little, little things. Now, I train my children when they are doing laundry, sorry, or they are doing cleaning of the house. So they are hoovering the house. Typically, young children, they are very, very impatient. 
So when they hoover the house, I will stand by them. They say, hoover this place. I will say, can you see this thing you have hoovered? It's not clean. So when you are cleaning things, always take a second look. Take a third look. I said, when you do that, and you master hoovering the ground, you will be able to master your books in class. When you are doing assignment in class, you will pay more attention. So don't always be in a hurry. Do things well. It's not how far, it is how well. So, sometimes I will tell them, can you see this thing on the... I can't see it. I said, you can't see it. You can't see it. <laughs> sometimes I ask them to go and study scriptures. I will give them two Bibles. Say, you, go to the basement. Stay there for 30 minutes. Study the story of Daniel. You, go to the second room. Stay there for 20 minutes. Study Joseph. Come back and tell me what you can see. After five minutes, they will come back. Dad, I can't see anything. I said, you can't see. My friend, girl, get out of this place and go back. I said, when we are driving on the road, and you see McDonald's 500 meters or one kilometer ahead, your eyes are sharp. You will pick it. Daddy, daddy, I see Burger Kings, Burger Kings. And even me, I cannot see it all. So you have so much vision. Your vision is so sharp. You can see McDonald's 500 meters ahead of me when we're driving the road. Now, to see a simple revelation in the Bible, you cannot see it. My friend, before I open my eyes, you will run back. After 30 minutes, if you come back, actually, uh, Joseph uh, and his brothers were going somewhere. I think the brothers sold him. Uh, and so, what can you learn? I think it's not good to sell people. I said, mm, it's not about selling people now. What did you learn? Uh, they betrayed him. Uh, hey, I said, is betrayal good? Uh, it's not good to betray people. So, you must not betray people. <laughs> Have you learned anything today? So, yes, daddy. Yes, daddy. I said, good. Now, what am I doing? I am fine tuning their ability to develop patience and to master little, little things. You are not faithful in little things. Forget the big things. If you want to master the mountain, you must have conquered the valley. <laughs> you must have conquered the valley. My children, they do me very well. Oh. I said, you know me. Oh. You can't rush the Bible beside me. Oh. By God's grace, I'm a teacher of the world. I can spend one week on one verse of the Bible. So as long as you are under my roof, you must chew the Bible. He said, chew? Dad? What you mean by chew? I said, you know what, you don't know what chew means. I said, you must chew the Bible. I said, what do I have to chew? That's, ah, uh, they say, that's, uh, that's ridiculous. I said, okay, be saying, be blowing grammar to me. <laughs> that's ridiculous. We will spend one hour in that room today. She, sometimes, you know, they will not creep, they will crawl to their mommy, to their mommy in the room. I say, mommy, mommy. I can't see anything in this scripture that he, that he, and the moment I say, go and tell your father. That is the story of Joseph. So one day he came back. Ah, he was so fast. And he gave me a big revelation. I said, you, you that you, we spent one hour, you are still struggling. How did you get that revelation? It is beyond you. you are, that, this revelation is beyond you. Tell me the truth now. A child of God doesn't tell lie. Who taught you? Mm, mommy, mommy, mommy showed me. <laughs> See, mommy, I asked you to take the Bible too. So go back to that room and go and study. <laughs> now, I'm saying this is very hilarious, but when you work with kids and children, you will learn the virtue of patience better. Children by, children by nature are not patient. They want to do things and do it. And, and that is how many believers are. 40 year old human being is behaving like a six month old baby. Never patient with anything. Little, little things are trivialized. It doesn't mean. It doesn't mean. All those, it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean we now form a mass of bad behavior at the age of 40. So, ah, how can a 40-year-old man be behaving like this? He didn't start like that. He had been doing that in age 12, 13, 14, 17, 20. Little, little gestures. Gestures. He was, he, he's not used to saying sorry. So when he grows up and he gets married and his wife does what is wrong, even when he's supposed to, to make, to, even when he is right and the wife is wrong and he's supposed to say sorry to the wife because that can happen. If you are right, your wife is wrong. Okay, sweetheart, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you are not married, that formula, you won't understand it. If you are not married, that formula, you won't understand it. Only the married understand that formula. That when you are right and your husband is wrong, sometimes you say sorry to him. <laughs> And when you are right as a man and your wife is wrong, sometimes they're like, okay, sweetheart, I'm sorry. <laughs> what is the second piece in the house? <laughs> little, little things. Do it well when you are not monitored. That is the greatest test of character. No one is there. What will you do? That picture flashes on your screen and you see a woman that is naked. Nobody is there. A one-minute video. 
What do you do? Do you take your glasses out and you shine your eyes? Ah, let me wash it. This is enjoyment galore for me. <laughs> or you switch that thing off. That is who I am in the secret. Your private life is your Christian life. These are the things that pastors need to be teaching believers. And we are grounding them in, if I am not faithful, do you think I will stand on the altar and I will preach this to people? I am still, stealing money. My name is on, the, on Google. I have slept with 30 different women. I am married and I am having girlfriend. Every time I go to UK to preach, I lodge women in the hotel and they are coming out to bring my pictures out. I will be the one talking about this. No! So that is the reason why when many, many pastors are not teaching these things, many of them are not living lives that are in tandem with faithfulness. Many of them are unfaithful. That is because if you are preaching what you are not living, your conscience will be pricking you. So when you see a man that is not saying the truth and is saying lies, it's because his life is not straight. <laughs> it's not straight. That is why Solomon said in Proverbs 20 verse 6, who can find a faithful man? Ah! This thing is scarce. It's like a lamentation. It is hard. But it's not difficult. Let me round up. Go to the church of faithful pastors. Go to the church of faithful pastors. Look for faithful mentors. Faithfulness is a spirit. If you are under the spiritual oversight of an unfaithful man of God, you will become unfaithful. The pastor of a church, the leader of a ministry, sets the spiritual tempo of that ministry. And what is on the head will flow to the body. If I am arrogant, my mentees will be arrogant. If I am a womanizer, my mentees will be world champions womanizers. If I am insulting, my mentees will be corrosive. It is as easy as that. Look for mentors that are faithful. We are not God. You won't see their hearts, but the little gestures around their life. When they are wrong, they apologize. When they are preaching, their messages. You will know a faithful pastor. Acts chapter 20 verse 27. Apostle Paul was leaving the church. He was going to Jerusalem. And he called all the elders. That verse of scripture is one of these, one of the strongest statements that Paul made in the Bible. Act 20, 27. Go and check it again. Paul said, I have been among you for a long time. I have not failed to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I have preached everything I have found in the Bible. Everything that God has said in the Bible, I have preached. You think that's a statement that is easy for every pastor to make? I have not failed to declare to you the whole counsel of God. That is not an easy statement to make. The counsel of God about giving. The counsel of God about holiness. The counsel of God about faithfulness. The counsel of God about obedience. The counsel of God about heaven and hell. The counsel of God about wealth. The counsel of God about the kingdom. The counsel of God about discipleship. Everything you have seen in the Bible. Paul said, I have not failed to declare it to you. That is a faithful pastor who is faithful to the text. When you see that it is even against the lifestyle of a member of your church, you say you still teach the truth. People's secret, secret and people's confidential information, but you still say the truth. When you are shying away from saying the truth because you don't want to displease you are not a faithful minister and if you are going to a church where the pastor is not faithful or faithfully declaring the whole counsel Paul didn't say half of the counsel or a quarter of the counsel he said the whole counsel that is what made Paul who Paul was and who Paul is still today and you and I can read from him because he's a man that did not hide anything he taught everything even to the expense of his life there is a man in Romania the name of the pastor is Joseph, Joseph Tief, T-I-F, not T-H-I-F now, T-I-F, Joseph Tief. The president of Romania and the government of Romania, they put a price on his head. We are going to kill this man. He's always speaking against the government. Now, not against the government, but what he was teaching was about don't steal money. Stealing is wrong. He was teaching balanced gospel, but the government, because they are corrupt in Romania, said this man must die. And 
Joseph Thief said to them, he said, for you, killing me is your greatest weapon. For me, dying is my greatest weapon. Let me tell you how it works. My messages are in tapes and they are all over Romania. If you kill me, my blood will be will drain all those messages in the heart of men. And it will make the message I'm preaching to have more great effect, greater effect. Killing me for you is your greatest weapon. Dying for me is my greatest weapon. Ah, that thing it blew me apart. They left the man alone. Said, what to, to be a more to have much greater influence in the nation of, of, of Romania. Paul said, I have not failed to disclose to you the whole counsel of God. That is the kind of preacher we want in our generation now. Men and women of God who will not hide under any guise to hide anything from people. Because you will give account to God. Everything you have taught. <laughs> Somebody came to me recently because it's a very confidential issue. I won't even give you the details. And he told me something happening to him, his personal life. I said, ah! My brother, what you have done is so terrible. This is the man I love, but say it's so terrible. I said, what you have done attract the judgment of God on people. I said, please repent. I will not tell you that grace covers everything. Don't worry. What you have done is serious. This is so serious. This is bad. This can attract severe penalty, even after forgiveness, because it is bad. It's like somebody killing somebody. And you're saying, don't worry, grace comes. Hey, I don't know what can happen. God will forgive you, but the consequences may be bad. I don't know. They can arrest you and jail you. And God will leave you in jail until you serve that sentence. What you have done is bad. I say, no, don't worry, my brother. Don't worry. You have confessed to me. Everything is fine. Just go ahead and live your life. That is not that is not for that, that that's not repentance. He will not feel the weight of what he has done. We are not saying you should convict people and condemn them and then you tear them apart and make them feel miserable as if they are on their way to hell already. No, that's not what I'm saying. Show people the old counsel of God. Now, if you are a believer in Christ and you are going to a church and your pastor is not teaching the old counsel of God, you are in great danger. The Bible is not about prosperity alone. The Bible is not about holiness alone. The gospel is about holiness, prosperity, discipleship, fruit of the Spirit, spiritual warfare, prayer and fasting, eternity, eternal rewards, heaven and earth. All those things are supposed to be part of the menu that a faithful pastor will create specific agendas around. In the month of January, it is going to be prosperity in the way of the kingdom. Tell people what it means to prosper, spiritual prosperity intellectual prosperity how they will work at how they can invest in businesses organize seminars in the month of february don't repeat it go to discipleship to be a disciple means to be like christ you must be faithful you must be loyal you must speak the truth in the month of may month of march teach about repentance and holiness when you do that over a period of three years you are feeding the people with the counsel of god otherwise they will become kwashoko Driven Kwashoko Pun Christian, a lot of people are Kwashoko. Their tummy will be big, big tummy, but full of jokes. You have big tummy, you think you are hitting the wall, you are eating jokes. On the day it matters most when your character needs to withstand the test of time, it just crashes. It just crashes. When you're supposed to withstand pressure, when you are being tempted, a woman is entering your hotel room naked and you are very flat spiritually because you are feeding on jokes, you just crash. You are given an opportunity to change figures. Nobody will see it. You will make one million dollars. And nobody will know. But you know it is fraud. Because you are flat spiritually. Your pastor has been feeding you with junks. You just crash. You will sign it without hesitation. Faithfulness. When people are not watching you. And then look for faithful mentors. A pastor that is faithful with women. A pastor faithful with money. A pastor faithful with position. We call it the three G's. Glory, girls, and gold. It is called, I was still telling a pastor this morning, whom God is using very well. I said, please focus on these three things. If you can do it by the help of the Holy Spirit, the sky is not your limit. The three G's. Glory, don't pursue fame and become arrogant and proud and people cannot even talk to you and 
that thing is a faster killer than cancer. <laughs> Girls do not run after other people's wife. No matter what it is, avoid sexual immorality like a plague. And then the gold, which is money. So the three G's, call it three G's, glory, gold, and girls. Gold is it stands for money. Don't corrupt yourself with money. Don't steal people's money. Don't steal that and offering. Don't lie on the altar. Don't say the Lord says when he has not said, if you need money, tell me, I need money. We want to do a program, we don't have money. Can you help us, please? We need one million dollars and we don't have money. Can you help us? Help, they will help. If they cannot help, let it remain the way it is. That is that has been my style. I have never in my life stood on any altar and asked people, please, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said, no. If I need money, I will tell you, please give me money. Can you help me? I need money. If you don't have money, God bless you. I won't say you are cost. If you don't give me, you are cost. If you don't give me, you are cost. God will not bless you. If you don't give me, you will be poor forever. I will never in my life do that, that, that kind of thing. When you do that, your heart will be shifted towards gold. And you'll be preaching because of money. <laughs> so go to a church of a faithful pastor. If you don't have a faithful pastor, and you go to a church of an unfaithful man. And a lot of believers sometimes, they are the ones encouraging some of these things. I was studying the book of Ezekiel. Is it Ezekiel? And the Lord was saying, I will preach the false prophets. I will also punish the people that seek the false prophet. Ah, I said, is it their fault? How can you punish those people? They are under a spell. And the Lord said to me, who, who are under a spell? All of them are not under a spell. A lot of people are under the influence of greed. The Lord said, the punishment of the prophet will be like the punishment of the people that I'm going to see him. Ezekiel chapter 14. <laughs> I will check that scripture and give it the, 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 the correct verse now. <laughs> because I know my, my audience are Bible scholars and they will go and check it. I want to, I don't, I'll, I'll let me give you the correct verse. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so, Ezekiel 14, yes. Chapter 14, uh, blah, 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 blah. Which verse is it now? Verse 10. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be like the punishment of him that seek the prophet. <laughs> that is Ezekiel 14 verse, verse, verse 10. Verse 10. So there are times that the people are the ones that are actually fermenting and inspiring a man of God to be greedy. You want to hear what you want to hear. So when the man wants to give you what is the truth, you say, no, I want that what he's saying. So when you see original, authentic, faithful pastors, you don't go to their church because they have 50 people in their church. You see a man that has 50 million in his church, so I will go there because you, you, are, you are not pursuing God. You are pursuing that honor, that ego. We have 50 million members. We are the biggest. There's nothing wrong in going to the biggest church in the world as long as you are pursuing God. But in the depth of your heart, if all you are doing is because of the crowd, you are just wasting your time. If God has led you to a man that has 50 people and the man is in Romania and you are in Romania and then you leave Romania and then you run after a man in Cameroon because he has crowd, those things are ephemeral. Time will pass and they will all fade away. Faithfulness is something you have to pursue and pay any price you can pay to get. Let's finalize this teaching this morning. And I'm going to end this way. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus told a story of three people who got gifts from their master? Talents. The first one got five. When the master came back, he got five back. Second one got two. When the master came back, he got two back. The other one hid is only one that was given. When the master was rewarding them, he said to the first one, Matthew 25, 23, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He was Derek Prince. Direct Prince of Blessed Readers first thought on this scripture. Ah, he said, notice one thing. That scripture didn't say, well done thou good and successful servants. He said, the world celebrates success. God celebrates faithfulness. That scripture jumped out of the Bible to me. Well done thou good and faithful servant. The Lord said, at the end of the day, you and I will be measured and rewarded by the level of our faithfulness. 
how faithful are you to your spouse? I gave you a wife, you abused her, you blocked her, you crushed her. How faithful are you to your husband? I gave you a man. The man became a minister of God and then you blocked his ministry. You frustrated that ministry. I had the story of a pastor, a pastor in Nigeria. The pastor and his wife, they had a crisis. And the woman said, I will not give you sex. I will deal with you for three years. This man was dying. You know what? The woman knew that she, he was a man of God and he would not go outside, outside to meet another woman. So she began to starve him of sex. Starve him of sex. Three, not three months, three years. You can imagine what a man will be going through under three years. All kinds of, all kinds of sexual experiences you'll be having. The man will go to the office. He will be depressed. This is a man that will be counseling people. The secretary was observing him. This man of God. Our pastor is not like this before. What is happening to him? He will sit down in his office remorseful. The face will be frowning. He will be agitated. Burning. The one day the secretary went, a lady said, ah, so what's going on? The man opened up to the lady said, I can't deceive you. I'm dying. <laughs> My wife has not allowed me to sleep with her for the past three years. Did he say, Jesus Christ? Ah, sorry, sir. Ah, sorry, sir. Ah, what can I do now to help you? Ah, you know, I'm your secretary. This is going to be a sin. Ah, oh, no, 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 don't worry. Don't, don't, you can go, you can go. You can go, you can go. The pastor did not know that he had just opened the door. The second day, the lady will come. Come and support him. Come and support him. Third day, one week, one day the lady came and said, Sir, I have to help you out. My conscience cannot carry it again. Right in the office, the pastor slept with the secretary. Look at how Satan works. As soon as it happened, they began to do it. The thing was exposed. The wife got to know the devil, the demonic woman, who was the cause originally, exposed it to the church. The church had our pastor committed adultery. They did not even consider what he had gone through, which should not be a justification. I don't justify adultery or any sin on any guys. If I am wrong, I am wrong. <laughs> oh, I'm wrong because uh, my wife is not. Mm -mm. That is not the principle of truth now. You don't excuse anything, any kind of sin. I'm stealing money because I'm hungry. If you are in my shoe, you too will steal money. Can you go to a court of law and tell the judge, I have stolen money because I'm hungry? The court will tell you to go. Ignorance of the law or any other guys in the law is not an excuse. The judge will tell you, so if every hungry man on the road is stealing money, what will happen to our society? They will still punish you. <laughs> the church had and the church scattered. Everything exploded. The man of God that was part of this count of the reconciliation was the one that told me this story. The church scattered. This church scattered, the marriage scattered. So originally, the enemy had a high for the ministry. It wasn't about sex. It was about, I will use the wife to destroy the ministry. <laughs> As of today now, from the last thing I had, the man is out of ministry. So, a woman that God has sent to a man, and the, your husband offends you, and then you use your body. So, women use their body. They use it to manipulate the man. Ah, they use a lot. And there are some men. Hey, if I start to tell you about men, because women are always more on the receiving side. There are bad men, there are bad women. <laughs> I can't be giving you the percentage now. I don't want to generate any controversy. <laughs> but I've I've been in between those two groups. You see some women say, ah, ah, ah. is a woman, is it a woman that gave back to this woman? And you see some, you, you, you see some men, you say, God, may my children who are women, who are ladies, who are guests, never in their life meet this man. This man is Satan himself. <laughs> All of these things stems from faithfulness. Jesus said, use that proverb, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Everything you are doing, from your going to office, your marriage, your ch raising your children, everything comes back to one point. Faithfulness. When you know the marking scheme, in one of my books, I wrote this thing. You know the marking scheme for an exam. You have seen the, the marking scheme of an exam. You have seen it ahead of time. Wouldn't you be wise enough to adjust the answers to a question based on the marking scheme? God already told us that I am marking the script of your life 
on using faithfulness as the metric. Money, zero. Fame, zero. Large church member, zero. I have traveled to 1,100 countries, zero. I'm a Canadian citizen, zero. I'm a Nigerian citizen, zero. I'm a president, zero. I'm a governor, zero. I'm this, zero. The only thing is, are you faithful? You have seen that marketing scheme ahead of time. Is it not wisdom to now go behind and, and now build your life, every fiber, every atom of your being, and build it around this issue of faithfulness? In your marriage, as a man, no matter what is happening between you and your husband and your, and your wife, set to it, do not be revengeful. Find a way of resolving it and do everything to the best of your ability. Now, this is this are under normal circumstance now. <laughs> I'm not saying when a woman wants to kill the man with evidence like this, and the man wants to kill the wife, and then you stay there and then die there. No. But under normal circumstance, make sure that nobody point finger at you and say, it is because I caught him with my friend. He slept with my friend. It is because I caught her with my with my friend. It is because I saw her. She stole money in my account and she wired it to Africa without telling me. Those things must not be in your dictionary as a believer at all. All couples have challenges and they quarrel and set to it. It must be normal things, normal quarrel, normal things that can be resolved. That when unbelievers hear it, they say, "No, now these are normal things now." Because faithfulness is God's yardstick. That is what He is going to use. <laughs> A man of God was preaching one day. He used the story of the rich fool. That rich fool said, I will build a house. I will expand my barn. I will do this. I will do that. And God said to him, you are a fool. Tonight, your soul will be required of you. That man of God said, some pastors, some believers in Christ, when they die, the first statement they will hear from God is, you are a fool. I was driving and I was saying that message on my radio, Christian channel. Ah! He said some people, that is the first thing they will hear from God. You are a fool. <laughs> he said because they built their life on irrelevant things. I have seen the marking scheme of God ahead of time. It's like you have seen questions and answers. This is what God is going to use. Is it not wisdom to build my life around it? Faithful as a pastor, whether there are 10 people on my platform listening to me now or 10,000, it, it makes no difference. Let, uh, let people be, I have 5,000 people watching me live. I have, is in miss zero. What are you saying? How faithful are you to what you are saying? The content of your message. God is going to build it on his own market scheme and reward you on that. Our 5 billion audience on your platform is irrelevant. It's just relevant in this world. And it builds our ego. 5,000 audience, 10,000 audience. When everybody dies, we face God and we are accountable to God on how faithful we are. Faithful to your wife. Faithful to your children. Faithful to your pastors. Faithful to your boss at work. Your boss commits money into your hand, gives you money to... Faithful, 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 faithful. The day I switched my orientation to this subject of faithfulness, it changed my life. I stopped looking at issues from an ephemeral, transcend point of view. I start having eternal orientation. If I stand before God today, can I defend this thing? All the books I've written, if God piles them up in heaven and I open it, can I, can I, can I, can I defend it? I shared a story on my on my timeline about two weeks ago of a pastor in Nigeria, a popular pastor. I won't mention his name because many of us we know him. He's late. On his deathbed, the wife was beside him. The man was dying. In fact, we prayed for him that time in our church many years back. We prayed and prayed, but he died. As he was sleeping to eternity, he started to mutter some words. The wife was listening. Yes, 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 yes. Matthew chapter 2, verse 4. I, I preached from that chapter. Yes, yes. No, no, no. Yes, at, at 4 p.m. Yes, I, I, I actually, the, the topic was. Yes, yes. The man had not died completely. He was already giving account of his messages. This thing happened in Nigeria. The wife testified. The wife was stunned. The man was hallucinating and sleeping to coma. And was giving account on the bed. Yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no. It, it was Mark chapter 2. Yes, I, I preached from that. Then I, 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 and then he slipped off to eternity and died. <laughs> so I said a lot of us don't know what we're carrying. All of this noise, all of this euphoria. I have the largest this, I have the largest car, largest job. Enjoy them while it lasts. 
it is appointed unto man wants to die, and after this judgment, these things we need to remind ourselves of it. We need to remind ourselves so that it will give us an eternal orientation about issues. If you are so much consumed with all the good good things of life to the expense to the detriment of eternity, that is not how to live as a Christian. Faithfulness. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Don't forget all, all what God has shared with us this afternoon. If you want to be faithful in big things, start being faithful in the little. You cannot be faithful on the mountain when you are unfaithful in the valley. Little, little gestures. Borrow money from people. You cannot repay it back at the time. Send them an email. Send them a text. I am sorry. I appreciate you. Please, I tried to do it. I couldn't do it. Don't split somebody else's church to start your home. Don't say that I have the same anointing. Uh, we are equal in Christ. Yes, we are equal in Christ. But it was the one that got called to start that work. You want to start your own work? God has called you. Go and start it somewhere else. Don't stay beside him. Don't go to the other up apartment upstairs where he is and start your own and then cause problem in his church. You want to have a husband? You are 42. You have any husband? Your friend, your best friend husband, because you work in the same building or in the same office, you start to throw to, 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 to throw passes at him and you manipulate him so as to destroy him and these things have consequences. I do not deceive people because I will be judged myself by what I'm saying. The Bible says by your words you shall be condemned, by your words you shall be judged. I do not, con I don't condemn people but I'm saying to my tell them the truth. I myself will stand before God and be judged by everything I am saying here. Start becoming faithful in little, little things. If you are in a church where the pastor is unfaithful, you know in your heart that this pastor is unfaithful. You have evidences. It is not about condemning or judging or if dropping the man of God. It is so evidently clear. It's not like an hero. Oh, he made a mistake. No, that is his lifestyle. He is unfaithful and you stay there. You can't be a faithful Christian because faithfulness is a spirit. Galatians 5.21, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, faithfulness. If the fruit, if, if, if the fruit of the spirit is a tree, like I said, you want to pluck a fruit from the tree of spirit. Everything listed there are two more of the spirit. Because everything we, we share and bear is the, the nature that of the tree to which they are they are they are connected. That is that is the mind of God to us. That is the mind of God for, the, for this end time. We are living in a very precarious season. This is the time for us to go back to the basics. Go back to the real things. This is the time for us to raise faithful Christians, faithful children. Teach your children to be faithful. Little, little faithfulness. Little, you must not tell lies. Even if they will kill you, you must say the truth. You must say the truth so that the next generation will have a hope. I don't know how long we have on half before Jesus comes, whether it is five years or five months or five days or five hours. But one thing I know, we are not in the end time. We are in zero time. If what is happening in the world today does not convince you that we are living in precarious season and generation, I wonder what else will convince you. I wonder what else will convince you. And this is what God has put in my heart to share with us this morning. Next Sunday, by God's grace, we're coming on again to deal with another issue around uh, this subject as the Lord lays on my heart. I'm going to drop the session now, and I believe God has spoken to us. But before I go, I have to give an altar call. An altar call. If you're listening to me and you're not born again, you're not born again. You know you're not a believer in Christ. You speak Christianese. Oh, God bless you. Oh, that is not what it means to be born again. Please, there is nothing to be shy about. This is not the time to be begging people to come to Christ. This is not a time to be saying, everybody close your eyes and the people will be crawling under their bench. I want to receive Christ. No, there is nothing to be shameful about Christ. If you are born once, you die twice. If you are born twice, you will die once. If you are born once by your parents, I am not born again, you die twice. You die physically and you die eternally. That is scripture. If you are born twice, you are born by your parents and you are born again, you only die once. And then you enter into eternal glory with joy, celebration, with the angels of God and with the saints of old. Let me not deceive you. That is the truth of the scripture. Please repeat these words after me if you want to give your life to Christ. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. 
I believe that you came into the world to die for my sins. I come to you this morning to give my life to you. Come and be my Lord and Savior. Come and forgive my sins. I commit my heart to you from this day forward. I come into your presence as a sinner to receive your free gift of righteousness. Make me one of your children and make me a member of your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, for answering my prayers. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. If you have said those words faithfully, deliberately, and wholeheartedly, you are now a believer in Christ because it is by faith that we come to Christ. Look for a Bible believing church where you will be groomed and trained and get a Bible for yourself. Start from the book of John, chapter 1. Start from John and read it through and read it through. If you need any counseling of any kind, send me an, an inbox message and we can find a time to schedule a meeting together by the grace of God. If you are listening to me and you know that you are not faithful, you know you are not faithful. You are born again, but you are not faithful. You are blocking your wife deliberately. You are hurting your husband deliberately. You are stealing from your boss. You know that you are doing it irregularly. And even in the church you are going to, you don't have any kind of remorse in your heart that what you are doing is wrong. I am telling you this morning, it is a sin against the law. Adultery is not a weakness. It is a sin. Stealing other people's money, other people's husbands and wife is not a weakness. It is a sin. If you don't repent, it can take you to hell. If you don't repent, if you do it and you continue to do it and you are enjoying it and you are enjoying it against your conscience, you know it is wrong. Don't make any mistake to die without repenting of it. I want to join you together this evening, this morning, wherever we are all around the world. Let's ask God to forgive us. I am also part of this teaching. Do not look at me as someone who is perfect. I am a vessel God has given this word to. I am also a beneficiary of this teaching this morning. I want us to ask the Lord to forgive us. I want us to ask God to touch our hearts. Every area where we have been unfaithful. Everything we have done that we continue to do. And you know that this is not faithfulness. This is not Christ-like. You are blocking someone else's success. You are supposed to sign somebody else's promotion letter. I will not sign that letter if you don't sleep with me. And you are a believer in Christ. I will not sign your letter of promotion until you sleep with me. I will not do this until you share your money with me. You have to give me 10% of your salary every month if I will give you that job. And the person qualifies for that job. And you know he qualifies. And you are manipulating him. That is unfaithfulness. We have to repent before God. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you forgive us. Forgive me. Look into my heart. Search me, O oh Lord, every aspect of my life where I am faithful. You know it, Lord. You know more than I know myself. In my marriage, in your my hands, in my businesses, in my interaction with people, Father, I ask for mercy. Forgive me, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I ask that you have mercy on your children watching me all around the world in the name of Jesus. And I feel like that we should pray about faithfulness. Faithfulness is a gift. There are some of us, we lack faithful men. We lack faithful men. And if you are looking for a man to marry or a woman to marry, ask God for a faithful wife, a faithful husband. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you will help us today. Every one of us that is in search of faithful people, Wherever we are, Lord, let them locate us in the name of Jesus. I ask that the spirit of faithfulness will rest upon your children, rest upon the husbands, rest upon the wives. Every woman listening to me, Lord, I ask that you baptize them afresh with the spirit of faithfulness. Let them develop an unusual capacity to be faithful to their husbands. Faithful to training their children in the way of the Lord, in the name of Jesus. Every man listening to me, Lord, I ask that we clothe them with faithfulness. The spirit of faithfulness, let it rest upon them in the name of Jesus. That they will become faithful, more faithful to their wives and to their children, and to their family, and to their bosses, and to their friends, in the name of Jesus. Every one of us that is surrounded by fake men, fake friends. 
wicked friends that are portraying themselves as friends. You are eating the food of a friend, but you don't know that you are actually swallowing the poison of an enemy. Father, I ask that you expose every fake friend that is surrounding your children. Whoever it is, wherever they are, be it family members, be it friends and associates, be it pastors, whoever is fake that is meeting with Satan at night, but pretending to be a believer in the day. Expose them to your church's name. Let them have a dream. Open their eyes. Open their hearts. Let every veil covering their faces be removed. Expose every fake friend, every fake relationship, every devilish relationship, wherever they are hiding around your children. Your word says that strangers shall be afraid and they will run out of their closets. Let every strangers, demonic strangers, that are that are masquerading as friends around the lives, the destinies, the marriage, the business of your children, let them be exposed in the name of Jesus. Expose them, Lord, and bring them to repentance in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' glorious and matchless name, we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Thank you, everyone. I hope God has spoken to you this morning, this afternoon. It's still, let me check the time here. It's 1.42 p.m. here. And uh, I wanted to speak for one hour, but, but this message is too deep for me to just undo for that uh, few, uh, I believe one hour is not, it's not going to be sufficient for it. So um, uh, please let me share this on your timeline. It's going to help someone. It's going to bless someone. Uh, whether it is 10 people or 5 people or 12 people, like I said before, one faithful man can change a nation. One unfaithful man can ruin a generation. So it's not about crowd now. It's not how far or how well. So what are 10, 12, 13 people become more faithful? Imagine us having five Daniels, having 10 Josephs in our generation. Must a man like Daniel, a man like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That we said, we are not careful to answer you, O king, in this matter. The God that we serve is able to deliver us. Even if he does not, we will not manipulate the members. Even if I don't have money to pay my children's school fees, I won't lie on the altar and deceive my members. If we have 10, 20, 30 more people doing that, the more of them we have, the better for the next generation. So it's not how much crowd of people, but the few people that decide to stand with God, the few that decide to stand for God, the few, the few, the few, the few. So I'm going, to, I'm going to encourage us to just help me share this. Next Sunday, by God's grace, we're going to have another session. And uh, as we continue to maintain our... I've been hoping once this week to do some groceries and I've been indoor. And, and it's been challenging a little bit because we've not been going out around the world. But hopefully, I'm going to sneak out just briefly, maybe tomorrow, today, or Monday, by the grace of God. God bless you and preserve you. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May God send you help out of his sanctuary. May the Lord remember all your offerings and all your sacrifices. And may the Lord hide you in the secret place of his most high. You and your family will not be partakers of this current pandemic in the name of Jesus. The Lord will put a canopy of mercy. That is what the Lord said to me. A canopy of mercy upon you and your family. The Bible says a thousand will fall at our right hand, ten thousand at our left. It shall not come near us. With our eyes alone we shall behold the reward of the wicked. That shall be your portion in Jesus' name. No matter how sickness and disease are ravaging the world, the Lord will preserve you in the name of Jesus. And the Lord will bring solution to the world as well in Jesus' name. That this season will not consume you. This season will not consume your children. This season will not consume your family. You will live to reap all the good seeds that you have sown. And that you shall not die but live and declare the good works of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. If you please go to the beginning, you need to listen from the beginning. I believe the Holy Spirit is going to impact you significantly with this teaching. Thank you, everyone. God bless you so much. I see you next Saturday by the grace of God.
next Sunday.